Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Siva Raghupati. I'm a principal solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been at Amazon for about five and a half years. Uh, the first two years I spent on building a couple of services, Amazon DynamoDB uh, and Amazon RDS, which is our NoSQL and uh, SQL services. Uh, I was a member of the team. Last three years I've been working with uh, customers, um, both including Amazon.com, um, on solving their big data problems on AWS. I'm delighted to be here. I hope you're in a great conference. Uh, let's get started. Um, so in terms of the agenda, uh, we're going to, I'm going to go through some of the big data challenges our customers are having, um, and I'm going to try to simplify the big data processing into multiple stages, ingest, store, uh, process, and visualize. Uh, then we'll go into each stage and figure out how to pick the right technologies, uh, especially we'll touch on why and how. Uh, and then I'll, we'll come up, I'll come up with a reference architecture, and uh, we'll delve into a couple of design, de design patterns and best practices. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to touch specific customer examples. Uh, Amazon Cloud Drive is doing a talk at 3 p.m. about how they used uh, these principles uh, within Amazon.com, uh, as well as I'm doing a talk with AdRoll tomorrow at 9 a.m. in the ad tech. Uh, we'll go through another version of how the big data patterns are implemented. So if you're interested in following through or watching later on, uh, those would be the two good continuations. With 45 minutes, I'll just have time to go through the, the architectural patterns. Um, so. Um, what are the big data challenges our customers are having? So in terms of, uh, I'm sure you've seen a, a chart like this in every big data conference, the volume, velocity, and variety of big data is ever increasing. Um, last time I looked at how much of data is there in the world, apparently there's 4.4 petabyte, uh, um, zettabytes of data in the world. One zettabyte is, uh, you know, um, uh, many, many terabytes. Uh, the way I internalize this, these numbers doesn't make sense after a point. The way I internalize this as, you know, every human being, there's seven billion people in the world, we roughly have about 600 to 700 gigabytes per human being. That's, that is the amount of data that we have. Apparently in four or, uh, four or five years, that's gonna go down to about six or seven um, terabytes you know, per person uh, in, the, in, the, in the world, I think. So there's a lot of data being born uh, because, of the, because of our digital lifestyles. Um, and uh, so practically, what, do, what does it mean in terms of customers using AWS? You know, for example, uh, the AdRoll, uh, I work with AdRoll. Uh, they're an ad retargeting company. Imagine those ads that follow through everywhere that you go on the internet once you go, once you go to a retailer site and buy. Uh, they're surfacing those ads. Uh, they're, they're serving the bids and winning the bids, et cetera. Uh, customers like that uh, handle about 150 terabytes of data flowing in every single day. Uh, their request rates, uh, about 60 billion requests, they serve about 60 billion requests per second. That roughly equates to anywhere fluctuating between 500 and 700,000 requests per second. They need to serve this at about three millisecond latencies. That's the kind of latencies that they want. The question for, for us is to how do we build systems that scale uh, to that scale? And then, and then this data is in, in exponentially growing. Every three to four months, the volume and the velocity seems to be doubling. Uh, in terms of the variety of data, Instead of just, in, in addition to just hand, handling transactional data, um, you know, we need to be handling you know, video streams, pictures, as well as uh, audio. Uh, in fact, a good chunk of the data, you know, about 20, 30% of the data is text. Uh, the rest of it is uh, the video, audio, and other, other different types of data. Um, so in terms of the other dimension, uh, for me as I speak with customers is that Big data processing is moving to real-time big data processing. You know, in other words, big data is best served fresh. Uh, some of the examples there are, instead of running hourly or weekly reports, people are interested in finding out what's happening right now. Let's say if you're, if you're building a system for handling credit card transactions, uh, rather than running a report at the end of the day, figuring out what, what, transac you know, what fraudulent transactions happen, won't it be nice to be able to stop while the transaction is in flight? You know, those are the kinds of systems people want to build. And for example, I was working with a you know, um, car manufacturer. You know, they are running various campaigns. At any given point in time, they want to figure out what make, model, and year is pretty popular in their website. What are the people browsing uh, these days? You know, people want to get these kinds of instantaneous data, and how do you process that? In other words, how do you build systems that can deal with streaming data coming in and, and in addition to running their batch processing jobs? Um, so, um, luckily, there is a plethora of tools in the industry. Um, you know, I want to call this uh, the, the Apache and the open source ecosystem has a zoo of technologies. In fact, if you look down, there's a zookeeper uh, at the very bottom there as well, the guy with the, with the mop. Uh, so, uh, you know, Hive, 
Pig, Spark, um, and obviously the classic Elephant Hadoop, um, et cetera. And if you look at, on the right side, if you look at AWS, we have a plethora of tools, you know, starting with Elastic MapReduce, S3, DynamoDB, which is our NoSQL store, Redshift, um, et cetera. So the, one of the big challenges that uh, customers are having is, what do I use, uh, what technology do I use, and, um, and why and how? Uh, that was the genesis of this presentation uh, for me. And then, now let's, let's, uh, let's try to simplify this, this, this processing, right? Um, one way of thinking about big data processing is, I really think of this as a pipeline with data flowing in on one side and answers coming back on the other side. And there is a time to knowledge, you know, in terms of, and, and you, you, it is going through multiple stages. You know, one of the stages may be in just uh, store, process, and visualize. The, the store and process not, need not necessarily be a single run. In many cases, there is a loop that goes on there. You, you, you store, you process, you store again, you process again, and then, then, you, then data moves forward. Um, so, you know, whatever you pick in between needs to fit in the time to knowledge or time to answer. In the case of real-time systems, that time is in the order of milliseconds. If you're talking about real business real-time, people are happy with you know, things happening in a minute or in a few seconds. Um, but so, you know, that time varies, and based on that time, you, you try to pick different components. I think that's one way of looking at it. So if you actually apply that paradigm and then actually, you know, slide, you know put all the tools in various categories, uh, you tend to, in a model tend to emerge. Uh, your app servers, web servers, and devices, uh, your logging frameworks such as Flume, uh, Log4j, et cetera, uh, are, are on the left side, on the ingest side, then you're storing the data in some kind of a storage tier, you know, which could be S3, HDFS, or your NoSQL store, such as HBase, uh, you know, Cassandra, Mongo, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then, um, then the data gets processed by a processing tier, which could be Hadoop, or which could be Spark, or um, you may be running uh, stream processing applications, such as Tom, or Spark Streaming. Um, and then later on, there's an iterative process there between store and process, then it goes to visualization phase. Uh, one disclaimer here, I put a, a, a few names of the companies there. As a platform provider, there's a big risk in putting those names. You know, that doesn't mean these are the only platforms we support, these are the only companies we support. I pulled some things as an example, a few things as an example. So if you go into the AWS marketplace, we have a rich ecosystem of partners that we work with. Uh, there's no big data without partners. I just wanted to thank them first and then uh, you know, take that into consideration as they move forward. If you don't see your icon, that doesn't mean AWS doesn't support this, et cetera. Um, so uh, moving forward, uh, let's deeply delve into the ingest phase. Um, and then in terms of the types of data that you deal with in the ingest phase, uh, I think of that in three buckets. Uh, one, you're dealing with transactional data. You know, think databases doing your classic create, read, update, and delete operations. Um, now, with big data, the rate at which these things need to be done is really, really high. As I pointed out, 500 to 700,000 requests per second. This was unknown even five, 10 years ago. Uh, we didn't build systems that can handle. Now, a team with three engineers wants to build this in three weeks, right? That's the kind of request that we're getting. And there are technologies to be able to do that uh, today fairly rapidly and easily. And then the second piece is file data. You know, your app servers and web servers are creating a lot of logs. You know, typically most, you know, if you look at Amazon.com, all the, you know, everything that you do on Amazon site, you know, goes to our clickstream processing. The clickstream processing loads all the data, you know, and pushes it to S3, et cetera. You know, we're moving a lot of files over, you know, from your app servers and web servers down to a place we can run clickstream analytics, et cetera. And then the third piece is really the streaming data. You know, the ideal scenario here is, uh, or the classic scenario here is the Internet of Things, right? Your devices your measuring devices, et cetera, measure the data, depending upon how much of memory or computing power that they have, they may accumulate the data or actually trickle feed that data into some kind of a store, you know, stream storage tier. Um, so it makes it much easier for me to think about these, you know, the ingest phase into three categories just uh, to simplify them. So the next question is, you know, what kind of a storage technology are we gonna use? Um, you know, as I was putting through the slide, I mean, I was realizing on the top here, you know, the, the transition from data, you know, this is sort of the, we were, we were when we were do, just do, dealing with databases, we were in the data phase, then things moved to big time in a, in a big data, and we were doing streaming big data in this phase, right? Now we're gonna look through, I'm gonna look at a couple of technologies there that are very, that are very prevalent. Uh, Kinesis, uh, Amazon Kinesis, uh, and uh, Apache Kafka. 
Uh, as part of this presentation, I'm not going to go into the details of each one of the technologies. I'm more interested in painting architectural patterns using that. So uh, we're running a track of uh, deep dives, 400 level talks on you know, how do you optimize each one of those technologies. Those, that would be a good you know, piece to complement this presentation here. Um, so let's delve into stream storage. Why stream storage? Um, now, imagine all those devices uh, sending multiple streams of random streams of data. Uh, those, those streams, those are like literally hot potatoes. You know, people walking around with hot potatoes, they need to give it to someone else, right? Uh, you need some, some tier that take these requests. And then these requests can be handed out to something like Kinesis or Kafka. So literally what storage, stream storage does is it gives you the ability to convert random streams of data into multiple, you know, into fewer sequential streams of data. You may, there may be a thousand or a million streams coming in. In order to process this, it's going to be hard to process million streams at the same time. So these things convert that into a few sequential streams. And those, the, the, the paradigms there are typically that there is a shard um, or a partition. In the case of Kafka, they call this partition. In the case of uh, Kinesis, we call these shards. And Kafka calls this topic, uh, we call this a stream, a stream comprising of multiple shards. So that's the, that, those are the primitives there. And then moving along, what are the other pieces, uh, what are the other uh, facilities of stream processing? Uh, the stream processing engines sort of gives you the ability to decouple uh, producers and consumers. Um, so uh, they give you a buffer, in other words, to write the data there, the fast moving data there. So these two tiers can actually either pump the data or process the data at their own rates, depending upon their business needs. Um, so the other piece that they allow you to do is to they preserve client ordering, which means if a, if a producer, in this case the producer red, is sending the data in a sequential order, like one, two, three, four, uh, even though it's going to partition one, the blue and the red is going to partition one, still, you know, the ordering is preserved. That allows you to do, let's say if you are if you're shipping transaction logs of sorts, it allows you to do processing in, in the order stuff came. And that's pretty important when you're dealing with non item potent uh, updates, for example. And, um, and then, you know, you can think of this as a streaming map reduce, which is a fantastic facility. For example, let's assume you want to find out how many, you know, how the producer won, uh, what, is the, what is the number of red, red pieces that they came in. Uh, you're able to simply launch a consumer for either Kinesis or Kafka. This consuming framework, what it does is it spawns multiple threads and ensures that a single thread is attached to a single partition or a shard. Therefore, you can do computations such as give me the max of, for a specific device, you know, give me, so then if this max triggers, is, you know, if you, let's say, if the temperature needs, if you have an alarm beyond 100 degrees, you know, it keeps on processing everything and checking whether, whether the trigger is reached. If the trigger is reached, uh, these pieces can basically trigger down, downstream actions. So the, it is critical to pick a stream processing engine that, is, that gives you the ability to do streaming MapReduce. Um, and, um, and then the other piece that these uh, engines allow you to do is to be able to replay, right? The producer produces the data and puts it into, the, into, into this engine, and the consumers can go back and forth in the stream. Let's say if they lost the state, they can go back and process from the beginning of time or end of time. Typically, the storage is fairly uh, kept there for a limited amount of time, we'll, which I'll cover that in the next slide. So if you compare these two technologies, you know, what stream storage technology should I use? Um, so both Kinesis and Kafka has many similarities. They support multiple consumers. Uh, they support ordering of records. Um, the stream, they, they allow you to do streaming map reduce. Uh, the latency is low in terms of uh, milliseconds, you know, tens of milliseconds uh, for both puts, for puts, and then maybe about 100 millisecond uh, for gets in the case of Kinesis. Um, and then both can do very high durable storage, uh, and then you can scale them to any extent you want. And then you can, they can also be, you know, uh, set up in a way that they can run across multiple availability zones. So what are the differences? Uh, in terms of the record life, currently Kinesis supports 24 hours. This data that sits in there, this hot data that sits in there, uh, sits there for 24 hours, and after that, the window moves forward, right? You know, whatever happened 24 hours uh, earlier moves, moves out. You can't read that anymore. And then it goes moving forward. And then now that, uh, that, that number is configurable in Kafka. And then lot, last but not, not the least, many of the customers even people who are very familiar with Kafka don't want to deal with you know, managing a cluster, updating the software there, scaling it, scaling down, et cetera. You know, those functions come for, you know, come, uh, Amazon Kinesis allows you, to, allows you to do that fairly very simply. You don't have to deal with managing a cluster. You simply create a stream. Uh, the stream gets created in a couple of minutes. 
and then, then you start putting records into it. If you, if you need to more capacity, you simply call an API and say split the, my split the, split the shard, and then you can get n number of shards um, you know, to process that. You know, for example, um, you know, I think uh, I saw a good example of you know, how, how well this can scale. Um, the Twitter does roughly in the order of you know, 5,000 or so requests per second, apparently. Um, you know, this is the average number of requests. About 12 shards or so can handle that request, and, and anyone can create these shards. I mean, I'm sure Twitter does a lot of other amazing things. I just don't want to oversimplify their scenario. I'm simply trying to make a point that then you can even handle Twitter streams by creating you know, roughly in the, in the order of you know, tens of shards to be able to consume that data. If you look at the cost of that, uh, you know, it is pretty, pretty inexpensive to do that at scale as well. So these technologies allow you to be able to even, even process um, something like a Twitter stream. Um, so moving along to the next, next stage. Um, now, what we've done is we've, at the ingest stage, we looked at the data, the three types of data, and then data, in transactional data, file data, and streaming data. Now we've looked at the stream storage technologies uh, Kinesis and Kafka. Now let's go into the other stages. You know, how do you deal with uh, databases um, and storage? And um, so now uh, this is the way not to build your um, database and storage tier. Uh, what I have here at the bottom tier is potentially a relational database management system. And then um, I call this the Swiss Army knife. I like Swiss Army knives, but I, I wanted to use that paradigm. Essentially, why, why not do this, right? It turns out that let's, let's say you're using the database. You know, you can use the database for many things. You can do search, you can do inserts, you can, you can run analytic queries on this. It's a fantastic engine. But what happens at scale, let's assume you're, you're, you're doing the 500,000 reads per second um, and then 10 writes per second. Now, in the case of Dynamo, I can simply ask for 500,000 reads per second and 10 writes per second, only pay for that. Now, it's going to be fairly hard to do in a relational database. You need to be scaling these things up for a, one specific dimension. Um, and then, um, you know, it's synonymous to, let's say, if you want a big screwdriver, you need to buy a big Swiss Army knife to be able to get that big screwdriver rather than getting just a screwdriver for a few, you know, for, for a couple of dollars, right? That's the basic idea here. Um, now, how else would you do this? Um, you know, I really think of the database and storage tier as a set of uh, technologies there. Rather than thinking of just a relational database, you may want to think about this as a cache, SQL, NoSQL search, and then complemented by S3 or blob storage, you know, or potentially Hadoop uh, for file storage, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, if you are using Amazon managed services, obviously we have Amazon Elastic Cache with a couple of engines there, Memcached and Redis. Um, and then you also have Amazon DynamoDB, which is our fully scalable NoSQL uh, data store, RDS, which is a relational data store, and Amazon Cloud Search, uh, which is our search engine. Again, you can replace, you know, substitute the names with your favorite SQL, NoSQL data stores. Pretty much, I think, from an architectural perspective, these things tend to do the same. The question becomes, you know, how do you manage this? In this case, managed services give you a leg up, right? You don't have to put engineers to do that. Uh, you don't have to lock down one or two engineers running your cluster rather than that they can focus on you know, doing what, what, what makes sense for your business. Um, so, you know, in terms of, I get, as, a, as an architect, I think that one of the first things that get, I get asked is, well, how do, you, how do you pick one of them? You know, what do I pick and how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, I think of this in, in a couple of dimensions, you know, data structure and query complexity and uh, data, data characteristics. You know, I've characterized this as hot, warm, and cold. That is the terminology that I, I evolved as I was consulting over the last few years. But let's see how it plays out uh, across, our, uh, across the various services. Uh, for a moment, I'm going to pick all the Amazon uh, tools there. If, I'm, I'm going to, if I talk about NoSQL, I'm going to pick DynamoDB because I know that the best. Again, you know, you Cassandra experts and HBase experts, you know, will probably rhyme with me. Um, you know, in terms of utilizing that, you know, in addition to DynamoDB, if you will, or instead, if you will. Um, so if you look, think of the data as structured and unstructured, um, you know, on the, the top, uh, in the, the top, top quadrant, you know, the two quadrants, I would say I have structured data and a simple query, and a structured data and a complex query. If you're doing it structured data and a simple query, typically your NoSQL engine um, you know, plays very well there. If you're doing a structured data, so the, the classic scenario is give me a parent, given a parent, which is my directory, give me all the files in the directory, right? You know, for example, Cloud Drive um, may have a scenario um, where, you know, or if, it's, if, you're, if you're implementing an inbox for a given user, give me, all the, give me all the emails that came in. That thing is fairly easily, you know, implemented using a NoSQL store. 
uh, if you're caching a result set, again, you can put that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a cache, like memcache or Redis. Um, and then, again, on the structured side, if you're running structured queries, you can, you can use a classic relational engine or, or search engine, if you will. On the unstructured side, um, again, you have no query or a simple query get put. Uh, Amazon S3 works fairly well. Nobody writes directly from you know, line of business applications to S3 Glacier, uh, which is our sort of the, I think of that as a cold storage. Um, then you can write a policy in S3 and say after six months, move all these terabytes of data automatically to uh, a penny per gigabyte per month storage. And then on the unstructured sites, let's say if you want to run UDFs uh, on your data, you know, your data is very custom. Maybe it has a lot of binary blobs, which none of the, you know, the, 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 the serialized and the serializer, the deserializers can deal with. You can write your own UDFs and then stick that in Hadoop and process that as well. Uh, so that's one way of thinking about this. The other one is the data temperature. You know, what is the temperature of your data? I like that gauge on this is being sold at Amazon.com, so I picked the picture from there. Um, so the data characteristics, you know, wa hot, warm, and cold. When you're dealing with hot data, typically you're dealing with, you know, low, uh, small sizes of items in the order of, you know, bytes to kilobytes. Um, you know, you want very low latency, you know, milliseconds, microseconds. Uh, your durability, well, if you, typically these are caches. If you lose a cache, you can always pull the data and warm up your cache from a, from a durable data store. Typically, the durability is low to high. Again, all these rules are being changed as well. People keep multiple caches, uh, therefore, you know, you can, you can run caches pretty, you know, in a reliably, in a durable way as well if you keep multiple copies of that. In general, you know, cost per gigabyte is pretty high. Again, as you move towards the right, you're dealing with bigger sizes of data. You're dealing with probably latencies. It it's taking longer, you know, milliseconds or seconds or even hours. In the case of Glacier, if you put something in and ask it, you know, get, get it back, it's going to tell you, come back in three and a half hours and I'll give you this data back. This is not, I'm not joking. This is true. Um, and then... Um, again, you're, doing, you know, you're going from you know, tens of dollars per gigabyte on the left side to cents um, per gigabyte on the other side. So now, in terms of a mental map, uh, you know, this is by no means accurate, but this is what I walk around with. This is my mental map of how these, the continuum of products play out. On the left side, there is caches. There's an intersection between the cache and NoSQL. You can use either, either one for some of that. And again, there's an intersection between uh, you know, RDS, which is a relational database, you know, SQL and NoSQL, which is our DynamoDB. And then again, in terms of S3, there's an intersection between that and, and the HDFS. Uh, and, and search, there's an intersection between search and, and RDS, right? So if, you're, if you fall in the intersection, you have a couple of options for, for implementing that technology or using or which one you use. Uh, now, really, uh, just to be getting a little more concrete there, what I've done here is that you know, taking our individual products like Elastic Cache, DynamoDB, RDS, Cloud Search, um, HDFS, S3, and Glacier, and I've run these through all these, you know, various parameters. Now, this was a hard slide to make, and you know, it took me like about two or, two or three years to make them, because I'm going to make someone unhappy uh, by putting this slide, right? Uh, so you're convincing my own <laughs> marketing departments. So I didn't put precise numbers. I, I put some, you know, in terms of milliseconds, seconds to give you the spread. Because depending upon the engine that you pick and depending upon how you do things, it may vary. But from a designer's perspective, this gives me a slide where I can simply say, look, if I'm dealing with millisecond access times and I'm dealing with a simple key value store, uh, maybe I can put that in a cache. I can probably put that in, in DynamoDB. DB, or I can go to a relational store if I wanted to. Um, and then maybe I can stick this in S3, but you know, what is the difference of putting this in DynamoDB versus S3? Maybe S3 will return this in about 100 milliseconds, and Dynamo will return this in three, right? Maybe the cost, if you compute the cost, S3 is three cents per gigabyte per month, whereas Dynamo is around 12 cents. I believe last time I computed it, 12 cents per gigabyte per month. So it really depends. You know, what are your needs there, and how do you intersect? Anytime I, I do the computation based on these parameters and the cost. Uh, typically, I do design reviews, which last for an hour. About 10, 20 minutes into the conversation, uh, I'm going to, there's a tool called AWS Simple Calculator. If you type it in your favorite search engine, it'll get there. If you plug in on parameters, it'll give you a dollar bill, how much is your rate per month, right? That usually guides my designs, because at that point, the customer is saying, look, we're good to go, let's keep going, or we're throwing up and saying, well, this will break the bank, let's not do this or we change our requirements, or we go tell the upstream teams to say, well, that's too expensive to do. Um, usually, they're pleasantly surprised, uh, especially if you use the right tool. In many cases, as you run these numbers, you'll find out, when we build, you'll find out one tool 
you know, does fairly well compared to the other. When we build technologies at Amazon, we try to build them, uh, we try to build them simply, you know, we want to make this very simple, and we want them to do a few things very, very well. And we price them in a way that makes a lot of sense if customers use that the right way. Typically, when you try to use this the wrong way, um, you know, the cost increases tremendously. So that, you know, has come in very handy for me to guide my designs um, on AWS. Um, so, uh, well, I'm, I came up with a, you know, sort of an example. It's a video streaming app. Think, you know, YouTube, you're building YouTube or something similar to that. You know, how would that look like if you build using these ideas, right? You have an application tier. Let's assume somebody is loading video into this. It's sending it to the application. The application is getting the metadata out of that. It's sticking the video in Amazon S3, and then it's taking the metadata and putting that in DynamoDB, and then uh, it is also constructing a search document. You want to probably search these videos using the title and description, et cetera, and putting that in, 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 in Cloud Search. And then uh, let's say if you have any permissions and other stuff that is you know, mostly amenable for SQL type querying, you put that in, 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 in RDS, which is out of the SQL store. Um, on the way back, how does this play out? Let's say if somebody is looking for that uh, specific video, you go ask the search to, to get the search document back. It has the ID. Uh, of the video that you want to get. You get the, you know, I'm looking in the cache here. Maybe it's a popular video. It can be, it is cached. In this case, it turns out it's not a popular video. Uh, it's a video of my kids. And then, um, then you're getting this from, from DynamoDB to the source, and it, it basically gives you the metadata to fetch the record, and it's, it's going to the browser. And then we have a CloudFront distribution that is set up on top of S3 that can actually, you know, stream the data depending upon where, I, where my location is. That's how basically it should feel. Now, last, yesterday I was showing it to the, I worked very closely with the Cloud Drive team. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you heard of Amazon Prime Pictures, we, can, we allow you to, if you're a Prime member, we allow you to store as much video and pictures as you want about yourself on Amazon.com. You know, we built, they built the system. He looked at this presentation and I said, hey, how do you handle, uh, can you also tell your audience how do you handle um, you know, eventual consistency here. In fact, the next talk touches on that. The Cloud Drive team uh, touches on that piece. I don't have the time to cover that. If you are interested in it, come talk to me after this. Uh, but, you know, one thing that you have to manage in this kind of scenario is you want to also have an authoritative store that stores consistent data because other data, for example, when we are sending the search document, that may be slightly behind. That may be eventually consistent at that point. I just want to highlight that as well. Now, what we've done so far is we looked at the ingest space, we looked at the storage space, and then we've also seen what technology to use based on you know, the temperature of the data, the structure of the data, et cetera. Now, let's go into the processing stage, right? Uh, well, processing is about, you know, think analytics, you know, your batch processing, or you, know, if you, you may be running some uh, machine learning algorithms as well. You know, I'm, I'm including all this into, into the processing phase. Um, then, you know, in general, uh, we're generalizing this very widely. You know, uh, this may be slightly off for some of you. But in general, the processing frameworks come in two categories, you know, batch processing frameworks and then stream processing frameworks. Uh, some people are calling stream processing micro-batching as well. If you're using Spark streaming, it, it simply constructs a small micro-batch in terms of these streams, and it processes that. Um, we also did a lab using, uh, you know, how can you do micro-batching with, uh, with data going from Kinesis to Amazon uh, Redshift as well. Um, so uh, if you hear the term, it's well, what, we really, what people are really saying is it's a stream processing technology. In terms of batch processing, you typically take a large amount of data and you run a Hadoop job on this, or if you actually run a SQL query on this you know, with group buys and order buys, and you, you basically process the data. It may take any, anywhere in the order of you know, minutes uh, or, or hours sometimes even to process the data. Uh, you know, how, that, how would that look like? Let's say if you're building a recommendation application for the scenario, that video streaming scenario we talked about, your app servers are you know, sending hourly logs, uh, clickstream logs to S3, and then you, we have this uh, product called AWS Data Pipeline. I think of that as, uh, uh, as a product that, that handles ETL. Uh, it wakes up periodically. You, know, every, you, can, you can program it to basically wake up every 15 minutes um, and then move the data, take the data from a single uh, storage tier, process it, and putting it in another storage tier. Um, if you, and you, you know, in this case, I'm starting a data pipeline. I've, I've created a data pipeline template, which will do this processing every 15 minutes. Uh, I'm starting that thing. See, they're getting the icon rotating was something I had to learn. Um, so, and then it takes the data from S3 and then takes, sends it to the, uh, to the Hadoop cluster, in this case, Amazon EMR. Then we process the data there, and we take the data and 
uh, put that in DynamoDB. You know, this may be patterns such as you know, people who watch this video watch these other videos as well. All this information is in your clickstream, and what this processing is doing is to assembling this piece and putting that using a hash range schema in DynamoDB, the hash being the first video that somebody watched and the range key being the other videos that somebody watched. So you could do a simple query saying, for a specific hash key video, give me all the list of the videos that people watched that can be materialized. So when this person is going to the website, if it's searching for a specific video, you may want to prompt them for looking at it. It's fairly simple to do this, right? Um, now, I've given a similar example using, uh, if you're running batch analytics, you know, you can put the data in S3, similarly run a data pipeline job, take the data and process that on EMR, and then take that and put the data in Redshift as well. You know, if you, if, you, if you like SQL processing, you can do the entire processing using Amazon Redshift directly as well. So I just wanted to paint a few pictures that'll give you a sense of how this one plays out in real life. In terms of stream processing, we typically take small amounts of data and ask questions. It usually takes a short amount of time to get your answers back. Typically, you know, think of one minute metrics and the alerting scenarios that we talked about. Um, so what processing tools should you use in that case? In the case of batch processing, um, you know, typically it falls into a couple of categories for me. Now, there, there's really the MPP engines and the Hadoop-based uh, engines there. For example, Amazon Redshift is an MPP data warehouse. MPP stands for Massive Parallel Processing, uh, where you have the notion of a master node and multiple slave nodes, and your data is distributed by the, by the distribution key across all the nodes. And then it can basically run your query parallelly across all the nodes and get the answers back. Now, the open source... Um, MPP engines are Presto. I've pulled a couple of very popular ones, Presto and Impala. Netflix uses Presto in a big way. I think they're touching that in the, in the, in the discussion. Of the, if you, I don't know if the talk is over or not, but I think they're using that. Uh, Facebook uses Presto, and Netflix is doing a lot of work in Presto. I'm sure you'll see a lot of blogs. There's a blog there on how they, why they use Presto, et cetera. Essentially boils down to they wanted something to to also process data from S3. They want to keep S3 as their primary data store, and Presto works fairly well there. And the Cloudera Impala, they've done tremendous work on actually you know, building a, a fantastic MPP engine there. Uh, so it works on HDFS. And then um, on the right side, I put Amazon Elastic MapReduce because um, you, know, you can probably run you know, Cloudera stack there, or you can run uh, Elastic MapReduce comes with a couple of Hadoop distributions. One is Amazon's own Hadoop distribution, our own distribution, and then the other one is um, you know, MapR. Uh, so you can run any Hadoop distribution of your choice, and then you can bootstrap these engines on top of uh, you can run what is called a bootstrap action to bootstrap these engines on top of uh, Elastic MapReduce. Elastic MapReduce takes care of a, if a node goes down, it automatically brings up the other node, and the engines are smart enough to basically recreate the data set that they lost, right? And in case of stream processing, Apache, Spark, uh, Spark Streaming, Strom, and Kinesis Client Library are some of the technologies to use there. Uh, so uh, I, just, uh, I just want to refer to this thing. Uh, there's one, one point I want to make out of this slide is that uh, there's an AmpLab big data benchmark that, that has actually tried to compare all these technologies. The macro point there is uh, Hive. Um, you know, Tez is, is another, think of that as another processing engine like uh, MapReduce. Um, you know, that's a new technology that, you know, that, that, that speeds up Hive. You know, it runs 50% fast, you know, queries run, if the query ran in 10 minutes, it runs in five minutes, right? Uh, so it runs pretty fast with, uh, instead of using high with classic MapReduce, high with Tess really speeds up processing as well. But if you look at the other side, Redshift really does fairly well uh, for any kind of a query, whether it be a scan query or aggregate query or a join query. And then in the case of Impala, you know, depending upon in-memory, if you're using in-memory processing or on-disk processing, the latencies in the case of memory are lower uh, and then disk is slightly higher. Now these numbers are already outdated. Uh, those numbers may be significantly better uh, right now, but I just wanted to make that point. Uh, you know, if you're interested, go to that site and check out the details there. Uh, if I tabulate all of these pieces, uh, in terms of um, the query latency, you know, it's probably one, one, one dimension that differentiates them, right? If you, for example, Redshift, Impala and Presto have very low query latency, spark low to medium, and a high anywhere from medium to high. And then in terms of durability, all of them give you fairly high durability. Uh, I want to think of Redshift, we keep multiple copies on the cluster as well as we push that to S3. So it, it's, uh, I want to think of that as durability as being super high there. And then the, the max, 1.6 max uh, petabytes, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if you noticed that in the keynote yesterday, NTT Docomo is already using a cluster with four, four petabytes. You know, that was a suggested max there, so we can do much more than that um, in Redshift uh, if you reach out to us. Uh, so literally, 
I think I just wanted to, the other piece to note here is the storage engines, right? In the case of Impala, they work only on HDFS. In the case of Presto, it works with HDFS and S3. Spark works with HDFS as well as S3, and the same with Hive. Um, so the BI tools, uh, you know, Hive and SQL-based engines have better BI tools uh, support. Uh, that's another dimension that you want to look at. In the case of stream processing, again, you can scale stream processing across any number of nodes. These things can handle any amount of throughput. Uh, the differentiator there is really, you know, how much of this is in terms of manageability. In this case, you know, each one of the tools, uh, you know, is fairly equivalent in my mind. Uh, and then, you know, for example, uh, you, can, you can bootstrap um, Spark streaming on top of Elastic MapReduce or in the case of uh, Strom and Trident, you'll have to kind of manage your cluster yourself. In the case of Kinesis Client Library, uh, you know, if you, we, can, we give you, uh, you can use EC2 and auto scaling to be able, and checkpointing to be able to kind of have this application self-manage itself. Uh, in terms of programming languages, you know, Python and Java seems to have the best uh, support, uh, while, you know, we're building support for other, you know, every vendor is building support for other technologies, other, other programming languages as well. So if you put this all together, uh, you know, all of this data, the visualization tier, again, a word of caution here, uh, those pieces, you know, Tableau, Click, SA, SAS, are very, very comprehensive platforms. They do a lot more than visualization. I really think of them as a platform for BI and apps. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that both your data that you're storing in the storage layer and the processing layer can be used by these layers to materialize the, materialize the data set. Now, putting it all together, um, Multi-stage, you want to think of your pipeline as a multi-stage pipeline comprising a process store, process store. And, um, and I really, the point I'm trying to make is a storage tier, putting a storage tier in between two processing tiers decouples your application. And um, the other piece is that, uh, you know, processing application, let's say if you're, if you're doing stream processing, you know, things like Kinesis and Kafka clients, in the case of Kinesis, let's say we have this Kinesis connectors, which can take the stream coming in and then put that in multiple data stores. In this case, I'm painting an example where the Kinesis connector for DynamoDB is putting that in DynamoDB. You have another Kinesis, client or, you know, Kinesis connector application. Uh, you know, think of this as two separate stacks running, continuously moving the data to do different tiers. And this happens, can, can happen in parallel. Um, and then processing frameworks such as Strom, Hive, and Spark. Um, now, if you, if you're, if the, the beauty of actually keeping the storage tier separately and the processing tier separately is in many cases, let's say Hive can talk to both S3 and DynamoDB and construct a result set that's a combination of both. Uh, maybe historic data is kept in S3, maybe the hot data is kept in DynamoDB. If you want to create a view using Hive, uh, separating this out gives you the ability to create a view across, uh, ac 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 across these various storage tiers. Um, now, our video tech told me that the blue on black is the worst combination. Looks like you're able to see this. So the basic idea here is that, you know, just to go back in a reference architecture, your apps are writing to multiple data, data, multiple data stores, uh, which is right there. Uh, your stream data is coming in on the left side and it's being sent to multiple data stores. Your processing tier is processing multiple data stores here. And then your BI and visualization layer is being fed from both uh, the data stores as well as these processing tiers. I think I'm not going to go into each one of these pieces. I tried to assemble some of those technologies that make sense in each one of the area. More importantly, um, I want to go into some of the design patterns. Um, and then in terms of the, you know, what I'm trying to take, do here is to combine the notion of the data temperature and query latency. So if you, if you look at the data coming in, the data goes into multiple tiers here, you know, either going through Kinesis or Kafka being, and then connectors sending them to various tiers. And then, you know, in this area, these are various processing uh, technologies, right? For example, you can do stream processing, managing your hot data to get, you know, real-time insights here, or you can actually take the data, you can run a native uh, DynamoDB query to get answers in milliseconds, or you can take the data to Redshift and, and run some batch processing on that. So if you actually move forward, uh, let's say if you were to build real-time processing systems, the one of the ways of building that would be potentially using here Spark streaming, putting the data in Kinesis using Spark streaming, Strom, or the native client to do that, or the application can directly write to DynamoDB and, and have a native client actually do uh, this processing as well. Um, now, if you look up uh, batch processing, again, you can move the data to S3, and then using Amazon Redshift, or Spark, or Presto, or Hive to run your batch queries on top of, um, on top of um, um, your data in S3. Um, so in terms of interactive analytics, let's say if you have you know, somebody sitting in front of a Tableau 
uh, and then you know, slicing and dicing the data. Potentially, you may want to put the data in S3, copy that over to Redshift, or put that in Spark, or Presto, and, and have interactive analytics going on there. Um, so putting this, uh, similarly, you know, if you want to use, uh, let's say, uh, a Cloudera Impala, uh, you may want to take a stream and put that in HDFS and do that. Now, now you can, you know, all these technologies allow you to do this in parallel. So this gives you a combination of mixing and matching various different technologies. Um, again, you want to put the data in a storage tier based on the characteristic of your data. If it's a warm data or a hot data, you, want to, you may sit in caches. You know, Elasticsearch, uh, for example, uh, is a great place to put some of your search kind of data in a warm, in a hot store. They process, you know, tons of requests per second. And the, lat low, the low latency is very low for access as well. So uh, I'm trying to paint the difference between you know, picking the right storage tier, right processing tier, you know, based on your needs. Um, so to summarize, um, you know, this may be how it, big data reference architecture. Reference architecture is a big word. I think, uh, you know, um, I think I, for me, by working with many customers, this is how it played out fairly well for me. Uh, using this design pattern in my head. Uh, and then to summarize, your data that you ingest and the ingest here comes in three different shapes, uh, broadly speaking. Transactional data, file data, and stream data. If you're doing transactional data, think of your data store as not just a relational engine, but a combination of various technologies, such as SQL, NoSQL, search, et cetera. If you're dealing with file data coming in, S3 by four is the best store to put in. I need to find another reason why S3 won't work to be able to put it elsewhere. And you can think of your storage tier as a tier storage. Rather than paying three cents per gigabyte, you may want to run a policy to move that to a penny per gigabyte per month using Glacier. And then in the case of a stream storage, uh, something like Kinesis or Kafka works fairly well. In the case of processing tier, obviously we have Amazon Elastic Map Reduce um, running various flavors of MPP and, and Hadoop engines, uh, as well as uh, stream processing technologies such as Stream, uh, Apache Strom, and Kinesis, uh, the consumer um, uh, client libraries. Um, so Redshift obviously is awesome at processing uh, some of the MPP style processing. Um, and then, really, you want to think of your storage and processing tier as an iterative phase. You know, they, there's, there's a loop there that happens to actually sli you know, slice and shape the data in the way you want uh, so that you can visual downstream visualization can happen. So in summary, um, you know, big data processing can be simplified using probably in terms of multiple stages, thinking that as an ingest, store, process, and visualize. Uh, you know, use the right tool for the job in each tier. You may want to think, think of, you know, the right, store, the right store for transactional data, file data, and stream data. And then when you think about processing, think of your query latency as one of the, le one of the leading characteristics. And then obviously we looked at the big data reference architectures and uh, design patterns. Now, I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. I'm here to take any questions either here or offline. Cheers. <laughs>